Then it moves into butyric fermentation, that cheesy smell. In this case, most of the body uh, flesh is removed, and the body begins its drying out process. The reduction in that soft food makes the body less palatable and less uh, able for the mouth hooks of maggots to break it down in order to feed on it. Okay? They need softer food, even with a lot of digestive juices. Um, they can't break down this newly dried out flesh. So it is more suitable for the chewing mouth parts of beetles. So we tend to see more beetles attracted, more uh, dermestids start to show up, that sort of thing. Something with the ability to take good chunks out of this flesh. The beetles, both the adults and the larvae, will feed on skin and on ligaments. So notoriously tough and um, stringy parts of the animal. The cheese fly is common. So you, we talked about this has that nasty cheesy smell. There is a cheese fly or cheese skipper. It is very common during this uh, stage of decomposition. And it will consume any remaining moist flesh at this stage. Okay, so it's the maggot. Finally, predators and parasites are still very prevalent at this stage. Okay, so we see a lot of predators, parasites showing up, feeding on whatever maggots happen to be there, left over, maybe late bloomers, that sort of thing. So here's a close-up of this particular stage. You can see we've got some big old third instar maggots here. They're starting to move. You can see sort of behind the head here, these are Rufafossi's maggots. These are predators. You see them in big maggot mass. But you'll notice this isn't nearly as infested as that last picture. There's not a lot of different ages. It's all third instar. You don't see any new maggot mass or um, egg masses, anything of that, uh, anything like that showing up here. Now dry decay. Dry decay, the insect sears in dry decay are uh, made up of insects that can feed on hair, dried skin, all that sort of stuff. They're what are attracted to this stage. These things include moths, they include mites, bacteria, dermestid beetles especially. So we don't get the huge maggot masses anymore. We don't get anything like that. We get it just covered with dermestids, with mites, with Sometimes moths. Moths will tend to show up for some fatty content, fatty content, and they will um, produce nests or whatever they can out of the hair left over. So this is what we tend to see during dry decay. So if here is, is a common moth that we see associated with dry bodies. We've got some good mites around here. These are domestic beetles. This here is domestic beetle frass. Remember we talked about the domestic beetles back uh, several weeks ago now. And this is what is left over after a beetle has fed upon a drying or dr fed upon those drying uh, bodily tissues. Okay. <clears throat> Finally, skeletonization. During skeletonization, there are no flesh. There is no flesh left on the body. It's just the bones that are left over. And we often see spent pupil casings. So by spent, I mean that they have it closed, either the flies themselves or the parasitoids that were feeding on the uh, pupating flies. They have it closed. They have left it behind. There's no more insect activity at this point. Even the beetles have left. All of that flesh has come and gone. And it's just down to bacteria. So you'll see bacteria that is uh, finishing up decomposing those skeletons. All right, now these arthropod sears. So you can see that there are different insects attracted to different decomposition stages. It's one of the reasons, like I said, that we've been trying to characterize these different stages. The number of sears varies uh, within the or with it with the person doing the counting, uh, with the type of body, with the state of the body, with the environment, with this with the season, all of that sort of stuff. So there's been a lot of work going on uh, trying to figure out exactly how many sears are showing up and how does that actually relate to the stage of decomposition. Now there was one famous entomologist that devoted a lot of his research time to characterizing and trying to quantify the sears. His name was Magnan and Magnan looked at the different numbers of insects that were attracted to bodies 
uh, based on their decomposition stage and based on the types of insects that showed up. So he looked at corpses in two major habitats. He looked at exposed corpses and he looked at buried corpses. He found that exposed corpses had eight distinct sears of insects. So the fresh stage had a fresh sear of insects that included Californy, uh, Muscadi, and Sarcophagidae, the ones that showed up very early. Putrefaction had Californy and Sarcophagidae. Active decay, you saw Dermestidae and grease moths. In uteric fermentation, you saw cheese skippers, you saw Thania, you saw Sepsid beetles, you saw Clarity. Uh, then it moved into the dump flies, the forids, the sylphids, the clown beetles. Then it moved into dry decay. You saw primarily mites. Then those mites turned over into dermestids and tinnity. That's a um, species of moth. And then dry decay moved on to tinnity and tenebrionity. So a, a type of beetle, or two types of beetles there. Okay, so he saw these distinct waves of arthropods, eight of them for a, an exposed body just on the surface of the ground where everything could get to it. This changed when that body was buried. So in a buried body, the number of sears attracted to the body was significantly reduced from eight to three. So in a buried body, the fresh stage will see the uh, attraction of things like califorids, muscids, sarcophages, and forids. Then during active decay, you only see root be eating beetles. And then during dry decay, you see rogue beetles. So basically those insects that could get down to a buried body. So there are some califorids that will, um, that will burrow down. Forids will burrow down like mad. They are called coffin flies for a reason. Some muskids, some sarks will burrow down into the soil to find a buried body, but there are very few of those later seers that will do so. So they don't see any real root-eating beetles um, unless it's the body is buried because they're already down there. They're able to bury and they will eat that decomposing material. You don't see any dermestids though. Instead, dry decay will be uh, primarily rogue beetles. All right, so this is a graph of the basic succession of the insects and in general it looks something you know you see just general succession looks something like this you get califorids through the uh, day 50 or so muskids will show up a little bit later fanids sylphids you can kind of get the general idea and so this particular graph is um, comparing sheltered corpses versus unsheltered corpses. Uh, each succession is affected by where the corpse is, the geographic location, uh, the covering, the type of corpse, the species in the area, the time of year, etc. So all of this idea of sears, of successional insect succession on decay is dependent upon different these different species. So knowing the general succession of insects on a corpse in, in a particular area enables the entomologist to extend the time of colonization even if the primary colonizers have come and gone. So even if we're just with beetles, we're able to extend that time of colonization estimation beyond. Now next, I'm going to have for you a video that you can watch some of this basic succession again and see if you can identify the different seers. So there is, um, you saw that video, and that was a video you saw last week as well. Hopefully you've gone and looked at it. <laughs> so um, it's going to be separate for you up on the website. Um, what I'd like you to do is make sure you watch that video. And last week we were looking at just the different stages of decay. This week I want to see if you can identify the different, the eight different seers that Megan identified or how many different seers that you identify. So go ahead and look at that and I will talk to you next time.